we have the pleasure and the privilege of listening uh, once again, but now at greater length and with your participation, he's going to make this a little more uh, interactive. Uh, one of the best analysts of Armenian uh, domestic and foreign policy, uh, Richard Giragosian. So without any delay, Richard. Thank you very much for the introduction. And as Professor Suni has warned, this will be slightly different from the usual format and more emphasis on interactive, which means I'm not shy. I'm going to call on people if there's a degree of timidity. <laughs> but for that very reason, I had strongly requested the platform to look at this particular issue, Armenia's pivot to the West, because it represents a significant change with implications for even your upcoming visits to Georgia and Turkey. So I only want to present five key trends in this topic and then open it up for not questions and answers as much as discussions. I want to hear more of your opinions and your perspectives as well. Hopefully we'll constructively argue, if not debate. But first of all, when we talk about Armenia's pivot to the West, it's important to note the broader context. It's part of a broader strategy of so-called diversification of security partners. And I'll be honest, I've been living here many years. The Armenian governments like to use fancy slogans, not as much as the EU, but years ago, it was complementarity in terms of foreign policy balancing between Russia and the West. Now everything is diversification. What this actually means, however, in practice is more interesting. We've learned a lesson from Georgia. NATO and the West is not the answer to all our problems. We're a little more prudent and a lot more realistic. The idea, to be quite honest, in terms of diversification of security partners is not about replacing Russia with France or the US. However, it is George Kennan revisited. It's about containing Russia, countering Russia. But given the economics and trade relations, as Diana has noted the other day, it's the economics that makes Russia an undeniable, not partner, but at least a trading partner. What we also see is Armenia's economics and trade is, whether we like it or not, geographically much more about the former Soviet space, the Russian market, the Eurasian Economic Union, and hopefully, to a degree, Armenia-Turkey, which we'll talk about. So first of all, the broader context. Armenia is seeking to win as many friends as possible, hence the new acceleration of diplomatic postings and openings by Armenia, repairing relations with Hungary, with Israel. But the second element here of this Western of this pivot to the West. On the one hand, it's Armenia embracing the West, but it's also a Western pivot to Armenia. And this is where it gets interesting. First of all, let's clarify what we mean by the West. In general, I would differentiate between the United States and the European Union and after Brexit, now with the UK as the outlier. And unfortunately, Nigel Farage was elected to parliament. Sorry. <laughs> but to be back on track, in terms of the differentiation, let's look at the US first. I would argue it's not an ideal world. Armenia and even this region is not a vital national interest for the United States and probably won't be. Having said that, I do think there's an interesting observation of US engagement. In general, US engagement in Armenia in particular, like France, 
is also related to domestic politics in the US, constituency power, presidential, but congressional even more so. However, what the US is doing now in terms of its engagement in Armenia and the region is driven not really by Yerevan and Baku, but US engagement is driven by Kiev and Moscow. Most significantly, Russia's failed invasion of Ukraine, Russia's status of being overwhelmed and distracted by its failed invasion has created a vacuum. This, in many ways, is the driver for US engagement in terms of that vacuum. It's about pushing back against Russian power and influence and presence. What we also see, geopolitics, is very much like science or nature. It abhors a vacuum. What we also see, what the US is doing practically for Armenia. First, it's no longer the Bush administration democracy promotion that went really well in Afghanistan and Iraq, by the way, but it's about democracy protection. And there is a genuine embrace of Armenia, given its rare commodity of legitimacy and genuine democratic credentials, especially compared to its neighbors. The US is largely focus, focused on the consistent support for reform, Samantha Power, USAID, but what's new is more direct support for Armenian defense reform and military assistance. Not offensive, but in terms of training and education. The second area of US engagement is looking at energy. This is very important because the energy sector has traditionally been one of the main areas and sources of Russian leverage over Armenia. So what the US is doing is working with the Armenian government to provide what's called a modular nuclear reactor to replace the outdated Medzamor facility. I'm not an energy expert. Well, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm an analyst. But in terms of energy, the way it's explained to me is the US will basically provide a nuclear reactor similar to what the US has on nuclear submarines. And for Armenia, that's large enough. The nuclear energy component of Armenian demand is under one third, and there is sufficient capacity. But this is an important way to roll back Armenian dependence on Russia in the energy sector. For the European Union, I see the European Union's engagement as much more practically beneficial and much more effective. And the reason is generally it's less provocative to Russia than NATO expansion or even US presence. Moreover, there are two observations I have as an American who lives in the region. First, this is the first time ever that the ambitious slogans in Brussels from the EU are genuinely matched by actions on the ground. That's very rare. And what I'm talking about is the deployment of EU monitors to Armenia. Yes, unarmed, but the deployment in and of itself is unprecedented because Armenia, after all, is still a country that hosts a Russian military base, still a member of the collective insecurity treaty organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. This was a bold move by the normally very timid and slow to react European Union. The second observation I have is I finally understand the EU definition of connectivity. Now I understand the practical benefit. 
what I'm talking about is the EU role in the restoration of trade and transport, the opening or reopening of borders and trade links. What we also see with this Western attention, the danger for the Armenian government, in my opinion, is the risk of unrealistic expectations. And one example I normally explain with the Armenian government is don't put too much faith in any sustained US interest or commitment. The example I would give, we had an 84-year-old, very sweet grandmother from San Francisco visit Armenia, Nancy Pelosi. She actually angered the White House because she broke with policy and only came to Armenia, not Tbilisi and certainly not Baku. But what we see is a degree of rare sophistication in the US engagement. And maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but it seems that the American engagement is based on finally reading Machiavelli. In other words, it's more cunning than we're used to or known for. And what I'm talking about is US engagement was calibrated in the beginning to be very noisy, very loud. The cavalry's coming with the dust of the horses. It's a John Wayne movie. But it's not sustainable and it's theatrical. It's not real. The cunning part is it creates a new environment when the US engagement doesn't increase, and in fact, they pull back, then the European Union engagement is seen in a different light in Moscow, in the wake of this US engagement. I'm not sure whether that will work, but it's interesting to see a handoff from Washington to Brussels. For the Armenian government, in terms of this Western interest, Armenia is still trying to learn how to play off the West versus Russia and China. And for example, we've had one and only one arms procurement deal since the 2020 war, and it was with India. It was with India for three reasons. First, was based on the reaction to Pakistan being allied with Azerbaijan. The second reason is to engage in a weapons deal with India is much less threatening to Moscow. The third reason is perhaps the most important. The military kit, the weapon systems that were acquired from India are exactly what we need. Defensive only, it's air defense, it's anti-tank, etc. Moreover, it's the first and only time India has sold these weapon systems to any foreign country. So there is a degree of new defensive posture. What we also see is the Armenian government's approach with Moscow is after years of submission, subservience, it's a new transactional strategy. For every vote in the UN, the Council of Europe, for every barter or bargain, there's a price for Russia to pay. Hence, the most recent example, the forced agreement with Russia that they have to withdraw their border guards from the airport and from 17 positions along the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. In general, this is about Armenia's reasserting its independence and sovereignty. It's about sovereign choice. Another big slogan that I finally understand in, in real life. Now, what we also see beyond the broader context and the Western pivot to Armenia is Natalie's question, the civilizational discourse. Natalie raised this during our roundtable. 
And as a Rhodes Scholar, I have to answer you. But what we see, sorry to embarrass you, but what we see is there is no contest, in my opinion. There's no contest simply because what are Russian values? Corruption, authoritarianism. European values for Armenia are based on attraction, seduction, if you will. And as an instructor, as a professor, I've never had a student ever that was excited to study in Krasnodar or Rostov. It was the College of Europe. It was Cambridge or Oxford. In other words, in terms of values and aspirations, I don't see much of a contest. In terms of civilizational discourse, I'm neither a historian nor a philosopher. What I would say practically is Armenia, right or wrong, believes it is already a European civilization well before the European Union and well before Europe. Um, and in this context, for example, the French president, Macron, is more pro-Armenian than the Armenians. So there's a degree of currency. The fourth issue is counterintuitively the importance of democracy. And I say counterintuitively because if you look at the War of 2020 and Azerbaijan's reliance on the use of force, it, bellicose maximalist positions, democracy is generally, should be seen as an insufficient shield or defense. However, democracy is actually in Armenia the key to our comparative advantage. In other words, the existential threats to Armenian survival have come and gone. We've passed the test. We've weathered the storm. The worst is over. Azerbaijan, the worst has yet to come. The future is bleak. Georgia is also unfortunately going in the wrong direction. For democracy as well, it's about governance. It's about self-sufficiency. And it's about reasserting independence. The Armenian population finally has more of a voice, but not yet enough of a choice. Nevertheless, our task now is to invest in the institutions of democracy. And there's one valuable lesson from Georgia. Georgia's Rose Revolution, Saakashvili comes to power, turns Georgia to democracy. One lesson from that, though, is an individual Democrat, Saakashvili, Pashinyan, is very important. But it's not the individual Democrat that means durable, lasting democracy. It's democratic institutions that matter. Hence, the challenge in need is strengthening, for example, parliament in Armenia and the institutions. And the second aspect of why democracy is so important is this rare commodity of legitimacy. This government was overwhelmingly reelected in early elections despite losing a damn war every Western politician would be jealous. But that legitimacy is matched by stability. And it's the stability that promotes an opportunity of a word that's an endangered species in this region, statesmanship. Statesmanship in terms of looking forward. The Armenian government is the first to actually try to shape public opinion and lead public opinion and not, and I worked for Bill Clinton, so I remember what it's like to be a prisoner of public opinion and polling. But I do think this endows the Armenian government as well with a greater degree of self-confidence, which also includes standing up to Russia, which also includes a commitment to concessions and compromise, a more moderate policy. But it's also based on a calculation where Russia and Turkey 
are seen to respect strength more than weakness or submission, as we used to do. And the fifth and final element of this is looking at an interesting but difficult debate over Armenia and the region that's going on in Washington now. And the debate is over what the hell to do with Russia in terms of post-war connectivity. The restoration of road and rail. This is very important for Armenia, not just to become a transit state, but to regain lost deterrence, economic interdependence. What's interesting as well is Russia has a lease controlling the railway network in Armenia. It also, through Eurasian Economic Union membership, has Armenia hostage to a role in this external trade and transport link. But the debate is this. There is a growing minority opinion that despite Ukraine, there is an opportunity to bring Russia in as a stakeholder, to play by the rules, and given the European Union engagement, a degree of credibility or even legitimization of Russia's role in the region. Um, and it's interesting where even the European Investment Bank and the Asian Development Bank are now working in their legal departments how to separate European Union investment in road and rail transportation despite Russia's hold over the railway network. For example, one plan now being developed is EU investment in rolling stock in everything but the railway line itself where Russia has the lease. And Armenia's part in this debate is also preparing for post-Ukraine. No matter what happens, how Armenia can leverage or play a weak hand better, can leverage a position, for example, in the Eurasian Economic Union, to become a platform in terms of Turkish exports to Central Asia, in terms of European interest in the future Iranian market, when it opens up, after a change of government, but can Armenia turn its prison of geography into an, a promise of geography? And this is where Armenia is, in some ways, seen as a trophy in the Kremlin. I would argue Putin sees Pashinyan as a trophy on the library shelf in the Kremlin. It's the opposite of Lukashenko. Pashinyan is a democratically elected, legitimate leader who doesn't need Russian support to survive, just the opposite. And for Russia, it represents a very different potential partner than North Korea or Iran. Um, so there may be an opening for Armenia, also combined with our own tactics of hiding behind Georgia, literally, geographically. We're hiding behind Georgia also because we've only recently realized how dangerous it is to have a border with Russia. We don't have a border with Russia. And for once, it's an advantage of our geography. And in conclusion, there is no conclusion. This is a very dynamic, not static process. So I just wanted to lay out some fundamental set of five drivers to promote some discussion because I'm the only one standing in the way of your rest and your trip to Georgia. Yeah.